Welcome everyone to the second uh, sustainability talks seminar series. We started about a month ago with the theme of water. And today we are going to discuss about quality education for sustainable development with three excellent speakers and the chairperson of this uh, seminar will be Rina Supra. Rina is the uh, director of Alta Global Impact. And uh, what you should know about her is that she's uh, doing very exciting pioneering work with collaborative problem-based learning between uh, teachers and students of uh, Global South and, uh, and Global North. And prior to uh, joining uh, Aalto, in the very beginning of, of Aalto University, Rina was working for UNDP and UNESCO in different parts of the world. So thanks, Rina, for giving us the pleasure of having you as the chairperson for this uh, session on quality education for sustainable development. Excellent. Thank you very much, Minna, and a very warm welcome to all the participants to, as what Minna said, is the second event in a series of Alto sustainability talks. And of course, as, um, as you know, the agenda is related to the sustainable development goals agenda of the United Nations and what we call agenda 2030, which really calls for an urgent and intentional transformation of our socio environmental and economical systems and calls for a global effort for a profound and intentional departure, departure from, from business as usual. And uh, this broad, broad political agenda, of course, has in the recent years been uh, crystallized into what we call the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, today we are gathered here to discuss, take a few different perspectives onto what we call goal number four, ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning for all. So this is a broad goal. Obviously, we have 10 uh, in, uh, targets and related indicators under the Sustainable Development Goals agenda related to this target. Many of them will relate to equal access and effective primary and secondary education, basic literacy and numeracy skills. And then on the other hand, we are also talking about education for and in support of sustainable development, inclusive of, of sustainable development concepts themselves. And uh, today's discussion, we have this broad perspective uh, is, is represented here through three different entry points into the topic. Uh, very war happy to welcome our three panelists for the day. Uh, first, we will have a look at uh, what does SDG4 actually really stand for? What is at stake when we talk about quality education on a global scale? Uh, how are we delivering on our education promises? And, uh, and where, where should we focus our attention in the big picture? Secondly, we will start asking what can a university, a higher education institution do in this regard? And we are going to look at, at practical examples on how to develop capacities in partner countries on really key topics uh, involving development and sustainable development uh, abilities. And then thirdly, we will take a look and turn the look on ourselves and try to see what we are doing in our own educational processes, what we as representatives of our own disciplines, our own research are doing to embed sustainability concepts uh, into our work. Uh, so this is a very exciting uh, uh, session to, to be expected. Uh, just before we start and hand over to the panelists, I'd like to say a few things about, about housekeeping rules and how, to, how this session is going to play out. Um, the panelists' videos are on, but, but the rest of the participants, are, the videos will be off for the session. And your microphones are also should be automatically, uh, I think they should be automatically turned off. But uh, you can you can ask for uh, 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 by raising your hand. There is a button where you can press to raise your hand, so you can ask to speak, and we can open your microphone for you to speak. Uh, your video would remain off for the time. 
another way to be uh, interactive in this session, we very much hope that you can uh, write questions into the Q&A. There is a Q&A button where you will see the opportunity to write a question and then our panelists uh, will be able to respond to them either in written form or perhaps taking it up in their talk and discussions. So please feel free to be active users of the Q&A uh, button. Uh, we have participants from uh, different organizations joining us today in the audience, so we will have very different viewpoints and entry points into the topic. Really looking forward to hear your perspective and your questions so that we can cover those. Uh, after each speaker, uh, you will have a presentation by the panelists, and after each speaker, that will be followed by, by a, a Q&A session for that one speaker. And and then at the end of the session, we will come together to uh, all uh, join into a panel discussion with all three panelists. So you can ask questions at either stage and post them in the Q&A and we will take them up as we go. So with those words, uh, I wish you warmly welcome and I'm happy to invite our first speaker. Uh, Professor of Practice Ritva Reinika has recently joined Aalto University at the School of Business Department of Economics and the Helsinki uh, Graduate School of Economics. She has joined us after a career spanning over two decades of, as an expert in international uh, development economics at the World Bank, has extensive experience from on the topic that to be discussed today, and also is an author of the influential report that has been discussed recently in Finland on stepping up Finland's role in global education. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to invite Ritva to talk about her experience and her perspective on the global learning crisis. Uh, thank you very much, Rina. I am sharing. Okay, it's going a little slowly. Okay, very good. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining. To me, it uh, happens to be in the mo uh, morning here because I'm currently in um, Washington, DC, where the World Bank also is, even if I no longer work there. Um, and just uh, what I would like to do this morning, uh, morning to me, afternoon to you, uh, what I would like to do is just to give you an overview how an economist, uh, an economist looks at this issue. And perhaps the other presentation will focus uh, much more uh, at the level of what you do at the level of higher education. Mine is, has to do with this um, uh, Sustainable Development Goal 4 in terms of quality of primary and secondary education, gender parity, literacy and teacher development. And how does this link to university? It links to it that in, in such a way, especially uh, that we do a lot of research in development economics these days. This is a very big topic actually. Last year, the uh, Nobel Prize in economics went to uh, three researchers who, who have studied a lot education in in poor countries. So that is uh, one way that a university and our university are, are con contributes to that. The other one is of course that in any country, quality education, primary, secondary, so forth, forms the basis for any other education. So what I want to do just uh, this short 10, 10 minute presentation, I want to just give you a flavor of what is the so-called global learning crisis and what does it take to achieve um, uh, STG4, especially in these areas that I mentioned. So I'll give you just a flavor through these uh, slides. Um, symptoms first. So I highlight mostly symptoms of the learning crisis and then talk a little bit about diagnostic tools that economists especially use in it. And then very briefly, what research says, I'm not going really into that research in any way, but 
what findings do we have now? And I do think uh, it's really very important, uh, especially in the pandemic that we all, including all the developing countries, live through now because uh, um, a cut in education may not just be those months that you don't go to school, but that there's a lot of evidence that it's a lifelong impact. And that is the agenda uh, once the imminent pandemic is, is gone. But just first, some symptoms. What is um, global learning crisis? So this example comes from India. And um, in rural India, nearly three quarters of students in grade three could not solve this two digit subtraction, such as 46 minus 17. Um, five graders, um, half of them could not solve it. So that's a, that's a symptom of the learning crisis. So perhaps also I should say the obvious thing that um, nowadays almost all children in the world get to school. There are some pockets and areas, some big countries, say Nigeria and um, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and so forth. But by and large, well over 90% of children go to school. And uh, in a way, one can say that that even in, during my lifetime, when I, if I think of it uh, from my perspective, it's, it's a great achievement of mankind. But what we have learned when studying education is that kids go to school. They can go there for six years or even 10 years and not to learn, for instance, like this India example. But this is not just um, in India, which is a poorer country uh, on the scale, um, uh, let's say Brazil, for instance. So here is just to show that um, this is about PISA. You are familiar with PISA, um, which uh, tests 15-year-olds uh, uh, for their problem solving and other skills that they have learned. So if Brazilian 15-year-olds continue to improve at their current rate, they're not doing well in the PISA. But if they don't radically improve their learning, we can see here that it would take a, to reach the OECD average for Brazilian kids, it would take 75 years. But in reading, it's even more serious. It will take 263 years, actually. Um, so that just shows that um, there, there is a big issue um, actually in many places. And here is, I'm going to show you just um, a picture of symptoms uh, globally as much as there is no global um, data that covers every single country. But um, this one uh, looks at, do the children who leave primary school meet the minimum mathematic uh, skills counting, numeracy, math skills. So if we look at high income countries, um, this is almost 100 countries have been able to build data that is comparable. Um, many, many high income countries, um, almost all kids have the math skills they're supposed to have. But here you also see the other blue um, ones. They are also rich countries, the Gulf countries, some Latin American countries. Not everyone in high income countries has those skills. And if you look at then the upper middle income, lower middle income and low income, the average goes down and there is a huge variation in the skills that kids have in math when they leave school. That's just the highlight of, of the global picture. Also another, perhaps still to say of the previous picture that when we talk about the averages, uh, or let's say, let's take examples. In Japan, almost 100% of kids, uh, Japan is the top country, uh, leave with those skills. And then you have countries like Mali, where only 7% do so. This one in, um, I have been involved uh, for several years uh, 
in a research program which is called RISE, Research on Improving Systems of Education. And uh, it is actually a very, very large um, uh, research program and uh, mostly financed by the British government. And it has, it generates a massive amount of uh, research because it's now in a big production phase. It's an eight year program and uh, six years are now passed. This comes from Indonesia. This program, RISE, has developed something called learning profile. What is a learning profile? It's just that you, you look at how well students in tests um, um, answer questions um, and then how many, that, that's on the y-axis and then on the x-axis you have how many years they've gone to school. Here this Indonesia it's like PS is primary school, junior secondary, senior secondary. And what do we see uh, from this learning profile? Those curves. One, the learning profile is really flat. These are simple math questions. These are really simple, not even that complex as in PISA. If you've ever tried PISA, like I sometimes try it from the Helsinki paper, Helsinki is whether I would pass, how well would I do in PISA? These are much, much simpler um, math and um, numeracy type of questions. And you see that in Indonesia, the, the learning profile is flat, doesn't go to 100 at all. It's very, very flat. And importantly, if you look at those two years, 2014 is the blue one and 2000 is the orange one. And between those, say, 15 years, um, there was massive investment in education and um, and, um, uh, you know, um, it, it, many more children graduated from senior secondary, junior secondary, and so forth. What we see is that the, the more recent learning profile, 2014, is everywhere below the 2000. So despite all that effort, learning actually um, reduced, uh, became weaker. Um, so th th these are system-wide issues, really. Why is it, how is it that the system um, generates such, such a flat learning profile? And uh, how is it possible that additional funding and um, investment doesn't generate more learning? Uh, I just wanted to show you, I have been ever since this program called Service Delivery Indicators was uh, put together already, um, it, not quite 15 years, but soon 15 years ago. Um, this measures, this has been in Africa mostly, more than half of African countries have been covered by these service delivery indicators. What does it do? It basically looks at what teachers do, what they know and what they have to work with. And um, just to highlight, so this has been in Africa, but now over the last few years, also expanded to other countries. This generates also researchable data, but these are just now diagnostic uh, evidence. And I'll show you a few examples uh, of that. So this is one. And uh, just to say that in, um, when you teach language, uh, whatever the language is, when you teach it, these are all fourth graders in primary school, you need to know more than just the words or whatever you are teaching at the time. In math, it's enough if you learn whatever you teach. So we can see here, for instance, that the minimum knowledge on average in Africa for teaching language is only 7%. So it's, it's like content knowledge of teachers is really a big problem in, in the learning crisis. In math, it's, it's much uh, better in the sense, as I said, that you don't have to necessarily know much more math from that, what you are learning. So this, this, this is actually from the teacher test and it covers um, uh, the curriculum the teacher is uh, teaching. So in math, the average is 68%. Uh, uh, just to give you a flavor. 
Similarly, from the service delivery indicators, I wanted to give you a flavor of the differences. So I, in my career, I've worked a lot in Africa and I, all, I once had a boss, he, he was, um, he's late now, but he, he was Zimbabwe and he always say, said, Africa is not a country. And that is really true when we look at this um, uh, figure. What does this say? This comes again, as I said, from the service delivery indicators and has country comparisons. So the, the kind of um, the, um, square, square, the triangle and the red dot, they are kind of, they are schools in the country categorized. So the top is the best type of schools, meaning teachers are not absent that much, they, their content knowledge is on the better side and they also have resources to work with. And then the red dot circle is, is the opposite. So what this, gra this graph then measures these schools by student test scores, because these data sets also test the students in these schools. So these are three countries um, actually happen to be Anglophone countries, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda. Nigeria is the largest country in Africa, 200 million people roughly currently. What you see there, different profiles, but the point I wanted to make in this context is that the best schools in Nigeria in terms of student learning are worse than the worst schools in Kenya. So Africa is a very varied continent on the learning outcomes. And often uh, because Finland is a well-known piece of success, people want to know, um, and that's fine. It's good to know and uh, what is done in Finland, but very often in African context, it's better to say, please do look what Kenya does uh, because it's a much more relevant context and institutional context perhaps than Finland. Okay, so that was just some symptoms, some diagnosis, and what does research show? Just very briefly, uh, I will close with this. Um, and I'm not going into that extensive body of, of research that is coming out, especially from, from RISE. So what one finds is that early learning is critically important, that if, Students fall behind in the first few years, like from one to three grades, they, they, they fall behind and they stay behind. And then you can stay in school for until 10, grade 10, and not to learn anything. And uh, that's the very big issue. And even in, uh, in the pandemic, we can see many uh, school systems say, no, we have to get the younger ones there. And it's really important because that's when you get the basics. Um, then the, some of the other uh, findings is that many school systems in developing countries are really kind of gatekeepers that when you do well, you get to the next level or job or whatever. So there are these high stakes exams and then the school systems begin to teach for them. So that is one of the big findings. And then curricula. Curricula in, in many, many countries are packed with all kinds of objectives and goals, etc. They are far too ambitious. And then when they are overly ambitious, children do not learn. Teacher training is of course, as you saw from the findings, is, is a really important uh, issue. So that's really what I wanted to give you in terms of flavor of research in, into um, basic education and, and also about the learning crisis, uh, because it's very important for a better world to uh, kids to learn at school. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Ritva. And again, I'd like to invite everyone to raise uh, questions. You can raise your hands or you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen where you can type in a question for um, Ritva.
Uh, thanks a lot for the for the very interesting, uh, insightful presentation. Perhaps one question for you to get started is that how do you perceive from your experience working with uh, Finnish partners and Finnish actors in this scene, like what could be the strengths and activities of, uh, of the Finnish uh, interventions in this area? Well, when, when I look at what, uh, what Finns are doing in various countries, they actually, their education programs to me seem very good. Why are they good? They are good because uh, uh, the, the Finnish aid usually or other participation is in the sector programs. This uh, education is, it's a sector system. It's very difficult to achieve permanent changes without systems changes. So participating in sector programs in all these poor countries, Finland usually works in smaller poor countries like Nepal or Mozambique. It's really, really very useful for the countries. It's useful for Finland also because resources are very small. It's a small country. Um, so like if I think of my last job, I was the director for human development uh, for Africa in the World Bank. My my portfolio was 10 times the whole Finnish aid. Just in, so, I mean, we talk about smaller size. When Finland is such an education country and this PISA success, it means that when you go to these meetings and fora to talk about the sector programs, everybody wants to listen to you. So it's also a winner for, for the Finnish uh, influence. So in that sense, I'm very, have, when I've looked at it, I've been very happy. What has been less uh, impressive, let's say, has been the Finnish participation in global fora. That there's like, I participate in global fora on these issues. Every single forum talks about Finland and Finnish education, and they are not Finns talking about it. So in Aalto, my, one of my objective, objectives, if I can uh, do something about it, is to train people who, who can go to like big international jobs and, and, um, and so influence through that way. So that would be one view. Thank you. I think uh, Pilvi Torsti has raised your hand. Um, let me quickly uh, unmute you. There you go. Will be, you are uh, able to speak? Yes, I am. I think I was muted once more. But thank you very much, Rita, for this insightful presentation. And I have uh, two questions. The first one is very simple. If you can just uh, have your the last slide with the five sort of conclusions once more, because it went very fast. And uh, secondly, having background about 20 years, both in international education and also working in education sector in, in, in Finland, uh, as a uh, policymaker uh, in, in the government and in the parliament, and then also in a startup with the, that we founded with Helsinki University, in a way, as a response to this frustration that I also shared that Finns have sort of both too little, perhaps, presence in the international agenda, in the international um, uh, uh, avenue, venues, but also that in a way we should have a bit more to offer than just people to give uh, presentations and expert advice, in other words, products. And now my question to you is that, um, while you also now work in Alde, that do you see there would be a need in somehow a strategic approach, getting together the sort of public um, and private offer? I know it's difficult and there has been several uh, tries, but I still somehow personally feel that even just a slide set, which would tell the same narrative rather than every now and then run into presentations that actually have misinformation even about the country and those are presented by people do, uh, representing uh, uh, Finland. So what's your approach to this problem that you raised yourself? Thank you. You know, sorry, I couldn't unmute when I had the slides on. So um, um, I think uh, Pilvi will um, will send you maybe the slides so, but, so that I can talk. So thank you very much. And it's nice to hear from you. It was 
during this report writing on the stepping up Finnish, uh, Finland's global role that, that we interacted a little bit. Uh, I, uh, I agree with you 100% uh, in the sense that there, there should be, in a, because it's a small country, um, a few relatively few participants, the more you work together, the, the better it is. And, um, and in a way, I, what happened following the report is that there is now a working group because what I, what I observed then was that, for instance, the uh, education ministry and foreign ministry never talked at all even if they both had set of advisors across the world in different countries, etc., That has now changed. There is a permanent working group and it works. I'm actually a member, so I know that it actively works. So, so uh, yes, there, there should be, but I often, well, I'm an economist. How does economists think about this? Uh, this type of coordination is a public good. Public goods are always, in short supply. No one wants to supply a public good. So it requires really an effort. Coordination, pulling this together requires a very big effort. There are some efforts going on, but it's, it's not at all enough. Sim similarly, the NGO community um, is, is they all are raising funds for themselves. So they went, want to be this, they want to distinguish themselves. Um, uh, and, and therefore the cooperation is not perhaps so much uh, favored from those incentive point of view. Um, and similarly, it, like uh, the export, to be really good in exports, you, you have to pull together. So there is some of that going on, but not to the level that it would really make a huge difference. But my experience having come back to Finland and operating in the Finnish context, which I enjoy, um, is that things actually happen in Finland, but everything happens quite uh, slowly. So it's a slow process. So Pilvi, I think uh, it's moving to the right direction. But um, another area, final thing, is I wanted and I also suggested in this working group that has, is now operating, that from, uh, pro, uh, from vocational education, Finland would do something. Passi Salberi is the one who has done the service for Finland writing the narrative up in English. It is hugely popular. It is an excellent book that he, he, he did. Si something similar should be done on uh, vocational because Finland has also a unique vocational education system globally thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ritva. And we will have a chance to ask more questions later on in the panel session. We are moving on to uh, invite Edward Mutafungwa, our staff scientist from the Department of Communications and Networking to start his presentation. Uh, Edward, you have uh, been a researcher in telecommunications and currently researching 5G technologies, but also very much involved in capacity building activities in African countries, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Tanzania. So we're happy to host you today and tell a little bit, a bit about your experience from a higher education perspective. Sorry, I was sorry, I was muted. So I was saying uh, thank you once again for the introduction and thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to, to, to present here. I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. Can I just get a confirmation on that? You would perhaps want to change it into the the um, full screen mode. Okay. Okay. So you can. It's visible. I just. Want... Okay. Um, I think for the next fifteen minutes, I'm going to uh, present uh, uh, some share some experiences from a specific uh, a educational activity, capacity building activity uh, in a particular country in Africa, uh, Eritrea. And this is an activity that exemplifies uh, one of the possibilities of Alto in terms of engaging you know, Southern partners on, on educational aspects. And the focus is here on uh, mobile communication technologies. 
uh, which is something that uh, is a is part of a core uh, research area in our department as well as uh, the courses given from our department in, here in Alto. First, I'll run through some background and motivation on, on why we went in this direction. Uh, this is a slide uh, on uh, the development impacts uh, for mobile uh, technologies both in terms of the networks and the devices supported there and the resulting services. Um, one interesting thing maybe to take away from here is that uh, in terms of the contribution to the GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa of 9%, this is a fairly recent uh, estimate from 2019 done by GSMA. Uh, the mobile ecosystem itself, that is the mobile operators plus the network of uh, uh, suppliers and uh, resellers and agents and so on constitute a very small portion of that. Most of the contribution to the GDP comes from the productivity gains that are uh, leveraged by both the formal and informal sectors in sub-Saharan Africa. And if one also looks at it in terms of the employment, uh, uh, there is about two over, over 2 million jobs uh, supported by the mobile ecosystem. And a good portion of that 1.4 million jobs are from the informal sectors, which rely a lot on these mobile technologies. So in short, uh, mobile technologies are increasingly becoming a key component in the uh, in raising the economies of these countries in, in that region. And this is only when you consider a relatively, uh, I would say, simple uh, mobile services that SMS based and voice and so on. The possibilities that could be accrued by uh, even more heavier use of mobile uh, broadband internet services would see the contribution probably going even higher than what we're seeing now. Um, here's a picture that uh, may sort of help to illustrate uh, a, as an example, some of the gains that we gain from the from uh, from the previous slide. And it has become apparent from the current uh, pandemic. Uh, there were some corners where maybe the access to broadband uh, internet, uh, typically through mobile networks in Africa, could have been viewed as, as a luxury. But now uh, with the pandemic, and in particular when you take the example of, of schools, uh, the impact has been huge. Uh, a lot of school closures in most of the African countries. And unlike other parts of the world where at least distance learning uh, uh, continued to, uh, to enable the kids to, uh, students to continue learning, it wasn't the case for most African countries. So you're missing school, but uh, you're also not able to learn in, through other channels such as the internet. And when you look at the projections, uh, currently the penetration of the internet uh, in Africa, it's roughly at 26%. Of course, the, the figure varies quite a lot from between different African countries, uh, but taken as a whole, it's 26%. And even with the uh, subsidies and network rollouts and so on in the coming years, you will still see a penetration coming up to uh, 39%, uh, taken for the whole of Africa. Uh, this figure is still quite low. Uh, when considered on the potential needs of uh, uh, broadband internet access through mobile networks. So when looking at uh, uh, deriving the potential developmental impacts of uh, mobile uh, systems and services, uh, the higher educational institutions have a big role to play. Uh, especially when it comes to creating the local expertise that is required not only to, to build and maintain the networks, but also to generate the, the policy makers and decision makers and so on, who understand uh, and can champion uh, uh, the use of uh, the rollout and use of mobile networks. But these uh, higher education institutions continue to be plagued by a number of challenges, particularly when you consider the engineering programs, which are required for this particular area. Uh, outdated curricular underfunding, focus on concepts which are very far from, from practice, 
and of course the the turnover skilled staff required to to train and 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 uh, propagate this knowledge locally these are challenges which are very well documented by various bodies including the world bank unesco and so on and i think as we also saw in the in in the previous presentation the challenges that are uh, faced with these haze tend to vary significantly even between african countries and in that sense whatever intervention that one comes up with has to be tailored carefully tailored to the local context for this particular talk we focus on the activities we have been doing uh, in eritrea in collaboration with the Eritrean institute of technology and this is uh, an activity uh, funded by the heiki instrument uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland. And we had uh, an interesting journey of three years uh, together with our colleagues from the University of Eastern Finland. So if I can just maybe dive a bit more on the, on this, on the context of this particular case study. Uh, providing a bit more information about Eritrea because it's not a country that is very well known. Uh, I myself am from Tanzania, uh, not very far from Eritrea. I think we're separated by two, three countries. But I, I, I didn't know anything uh, going into this uh, uh, project and also planning activities for this uh, towards, uh, towards Eritrea. We had been doing some activities previously in Tanzania and Ethiopia. And it was clear that whatever experiences that we derive from there, we have to have a rethink. Looking at the, the various numbers and stats here uh, for Eritrea, uh, it's a very young population, uh, very, he very heavy on the base, and it's increasingly urbanized. Uh, you could actually see it in Asmara, the capital, uh, in terms of the population density and so on. And this is a trend that is likely to, con to continue for quite a number of years, or decades even. Um, it's one of the only two African countries with a state-owned monopoly as a mobile operator. And uh, there are some significant implications on this in terms of service availability and so on, due to the lack of the competition in the country and the very strong centralized regulation. Uh, there are some indicators, uh, for example, from ITU, uh, the ICT Development Index, which indicates that uh, Eritrea, uh, in one of the indicators for ITU, Eritrea was coming almost last or second last. So even in the conversation of connecting the unconnected in Africa, Eritrea could, could likely be considered the most unconnected country there. And these figures we gathered uh, maybe four or five years ago when we are making our first entry uh, into Eritrea for the project. And more recent figures uh, do not show significant improvement for that, from that. Um, mobile internet, uh, which is the main way of accessing the internet in Eritrea and indeed in most of Africa, the penetration remains very low. And even the activities or the services that uh, users are utilizing over the internet are also very low in single digits and sometimes at, you know, a single percentage uh, penetration. Uh, the implications of this are very strong, not just in terms of you know, accessing entertainment content and so on, but even when one to try to think about education and so forth. So having seen that, how we approached uh, Eritrea, uh, we, we had a course on advanced wireless technologies which was loosely based on one of the courses offered by our department. Uh, in formulating the rationale and learning outcome for this course, there's few things we considered. Uh, first, we wanted them to learn what is actually used or could be used by Eritrea in the future in terms of mobile technologies. And yet it should be noted that Eritrea is no different from other countries. They also use technologies that are based on global mobile standards. At least some of the standards that have been heavily used in Finland maybe uh, 20 or 15 years ago. Uh, we also wanted to, them to learn uh, by doing, having a course that also stresses very much the, the hands-on approach and in, in terms of managing problems and also problem solving as well. We had to have a course that also tailored to 
a very heterogeneous uh, mix in the classroom. Initially, our impression was that uh, we will be giving instruction only to students, but then it was, of course, extended to the academic and also technical support staff. And later, we even had uh, a participants from the state-owned uh, mobile company, a telecom company, Airtel. Uh, this mix of students, uh, of course, created a challenge in terms of uh, 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 telling the content activities and so on, but it also allowed for very interesting exchanges. Uh, in terms of the hands-on training, maybe we'll share just one concrete example. And this is related to, uh, to an activity, uh, sorry, uh, to an activity on, on network planning. Um, network planning can be viewed, you know, as a very technical activity, but when you dig down to it, it's just trying to understand the impacts of the trade-offs of how can you provide internet access or internet service of a certain quality uh, versus what you can you afford in terms of the investment and eventually make it affordable for the end users. Um, this will usually presents a number of questions where you can answer using various tools and approaches. And it's typically an activity that would be done by, uh, in a place that Eritrea will be done by multinational companies, uh, international consulting companies, and so on. So our target here is to be able to de demystify this process uh, to allow them to be able to you know, understand all these technology choices that are made, how the comparative analysis is done, and so on. And you're using a tools to be able to understand uh, the deployment of base stations. So the base station is the key infrastructure that one considers when deploying mobile networks. So how many do we need? Where should we de deploy these base stations? What are the parameters we should configure and so on? And uh, in doing this, we made heavy use of software-based tools. Uh, software is quite attractive in a sense of the uh, uh, low cost uh, uh, or, or, or low upfront investment required to be able to carry out the training. And the tools vary quite a bit. So I present here two extremes. On one extreme, you have tools which can be simply made out of spreadsheets, but which could still tell you a lot on, for example, responding to the question on how many base stations are required and, and hence how much would it cost. And spreadsheets here are something that you can you know, develop, okay, using a, a you know, tools which are paid for Microsoft Excel, but also even open source tools. This is a tool that we use that was originally developed and used for teaching uh, within Alto in our department. On the other extreme, uh, you can have more sophisticated, uh, uh, usually commercial based tools, which allow you to have even more intuitive graphical user interfaces. So the network planners could actually see their local areas in which they're planning for their local towns, buildings, and vegetations, and so on. And they can make decisions on where do they place these base stations and what kind of parameters that they can change to be able to reduce the number of base stations that it requires, and so on. Um, here, we organize this activity because uh, of the lack of a uh, number of uh, 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 licenses, but also we felt that uh, when these activities are organized as a group work, it allows for more rich interaction between the students and also to be able to have uh, conversations between students, academic staff, but also people from industry, from Eritrea, we saw earlier. So in some conclusions based on these experiences, uh, the three key takeaways I could see here is that uh, what we saw, it was something that exemplified the mutual value that you can get uh, in such collaboration activities between the North and the South. So it was in a case of uh, uh, alto personnel going to Eritrea to teach them about these wonderful new technologies. But it was also a chance for, 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 for alto participants to learn more about usage of technologies in some very different contexts and also the many possibilities that uh, come with that. So it really takes us uh, outside the box as, as far as the technology use cases and so on are concerned. Um, this is an area, uh, mobile technologies, uh, but ICT area in general, it's an area that uh, is changing quite a lot. So it's something that you cannot do as a one-off. You have to have continuous uh, 
a continuous interaction between the north and the south so that to be able to to be able to keep uh, partners updated on the more recent developments and possibilities so whereas here there is already quite a lot of you know conversation about you know the possibilities of 5g mobile networks and internet or things and so on and this is something that has not yet been explored at all uh, uh, in the, in Eritrea, for example. So there are possibilities to continue this conversation with them, and they even try to look for e even more impactful uh, 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 outcomes from the usage of mobile technologies. Uh, uh, lastly, software tools is something that we thought provided a very exciting possibilities for. Uh, engineering pedagogy, particularly for mobile technology education in Eritrea. More affordable, more flexible. And this is something that we see uh, as a future, whereas before we had very a lot of barriers due to the high cost of hardware and you know high, highly stocked labs, and teaching labs and so on. Well, thinking of it now also from the SDG4 perspective, I think when we were framing activities and going in, into Eritrea, we didn't really maybe give this much thought, but in the course of preparing this presentation, we tried to think of how we may have had linkages with the SDG4. And um, first one thing obviously to note is that uh, our target was more on imparting more advanced ICT skills, which nonetheless were still quite important, especially when you consider uh, the training of experts who will then come and uh, uh, ensure, for example, that internet access uh, is available in the country and also, you know, uh, and, and schools are connected. We also saw the power of, of the use of computers and the software now that uh, we showed in the examples that runs over it and how this is critical in achieving learning objectives, even in high learning institutions. And, and also, uh, see how we can have uh, equal access for all in terms of the affordable uh, education, so affordability through the use of software, but also the increased quality, uh, going from very theoretical type of teaching to the use of software tools to be able to, to give the students a better understanding of the power of mobile technologies in, in tertiary education. Thank you uh, for your uh, attention and would welcome some questions now. Thanks very much, Edward. And um, uh, please ask your questions in the Q&A so Edward can answer them also in written form. Uh, perhaps just one question to you, Edward, before we move on to the next presentation is, of course, your activity is actually an example. It's a case study example of what happens at the level of education collaboration, which takes place at the in uh, between higher education institutions. So it's a partnership between Alta University and other, and other universities in African countries. And I think this is also part of what we see as, as, as uh, uh, SDG4, but uh, at the very other end, we were talking about primary and secondary education. And now we are talking about how do universities perhaps collaborate together this is also something that has been discussed recently in the context of the new kind of emerging Finnish Africa strategy, as well as the European Union's Africa strategy. And just from your perspective, uh, what is there um, that within this type of collaboration really reflects the, uh, the, the, the emphasis of these new strategies, which is about no longer just bringing information or, or transferring knowledge from north uh, to south, from a northern university to a southern university, but really about peer learning, doing together, learning together, universities functioning together, functioning on an equal basis. I think this is the way of the future and, and this type of collaboration could provide footing for that. Could you just say a few words on your experience from that perspective? Uh, yeah, I think, uh... Overall, it was it it it, it was quite humbling uh, in also understanding of how much we don't know about certain contexts, uh, but also uh, giving a bit more meaning uh, to what we see as just you know sort of uh, routine technology research and education uh, in Finland to see what what can actually be uh, uh, achieved in terms of the impacts in in some of those regions. Um, I, I, I felt that what we were teaching, particularly in this case, we were kind of teaching, it, it was more like a, a, a training of trainers uh, program. Uh, one thing that we see, we have these uh, 
a, a few institutions which are the leading institutions, particularly in, in areas such as mobile communications in some of these different countries. And these teachers uh, usually would have also teaching roles in other institutions in the same country. So a, there is also a snowballing effect there uh, that continues even after we have left. Uh, so in that sense, you want to leave um, uh, as much as uh, as, as much as uh, uh, knowledge as possible, not just in terms of the content, but in terms of what these teachers are able to impart as well, not just in the institutions, but in some of the other institutions that they go to give these uh, uh, visiting lectures. And in that sense, also having them the, the right tools to allow them to, to go and teach there, you know, like the Excel tool example that I showed earlier is something that can be easily uh, redeployed across other institutions at, at no cost at all. So maybe just to keep time short, maybe that's what I would say, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. Uh, I, you, please ask your questions in the Q&A uh, so Edward can answer. We will move to uh, invite Annina Suominen, who is the Associate Professor of Art Pedagogy and Head of Education at Aalto University's Department of Arts. Uh, Annina, you're very welcome. Um, you will be talking about how to actually look at what we are teaching in terms of sustainable development concepts and education within our own teaching, within our own thinking, how can we advance some of the values and ethical perspectives and norms under, underpinning sustainability in our own work? Welcome, Annina. There. Can you see and hear me now? Yes, everything okay. 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 Um, thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity. And from my perspective, just the fact that we're talking about these issues together on different levels from different perspectives is an incredibly important and uh, good step for moving forward. So my professorship is in um, art pedagogy. So I think about constantly what it means to learn with and through art. I work mainly in higher education, but when I present these issues, um, the context should be understood more broadly because we, for example, train our teachers to, um, to cover the whole or most of Finland. And they also work in other cultural institutions, libraries, museums, galleries, in different government offices. So we talk about and when we talk about these challenges that we are facing on a very rapid, um, rapid changes in climate or species or politics global on global and local levels, we our education needs to respond to them fast. Um, the turnaround rate for Finnish teachers with the pandemic was 48 hours and they changed what they do and how they do it. And then there's the longer term impacts and effects that we also need to consider. So as we work towards the achieving the SDGs and especially number four, the higher education, we are, we are constantly thinking about these issues in the context of what, what does this mean for future generations? What will be taught to t children in schools? The world is looking at what's happening in the Finnish schools. So we have a direct and indirect impact uh, globally as well. Let me see. <clears throat> so my guiding question for a lot of things that I do is how to formulate and facilitate arts education and pedagogy that have a sustainable long-term impact and that can influence broader changes in beliefs, attitudes and behavior. So in the sense we're talking about not just what we teach and how we teach, but how we perceive what it means to be a human in relation to other species, what it means to be a Finnish person relating to everybody else on the globe, and so on. So these are always ontological and epistemolo epistemological questions in addition to being pedagogical and didactic. This is kind of some of the things I've recently done and that I continue to do. And this is just a very slim example of what we do. None of this happens in silos. We have social media networks where 
over 1,000 educators and artists from around the globe participate and contribute. We work in the European networks, global networks, and Finnish networks in across the arts and with the ministries to figure out what we could do to improve our education system as well as aim towards the SDGs. And this book that is on the top is kind of interesting because it collects different examples from various arts perspectives from around the Europe. So, oops, all the blocks are in front of my actual texts. I need to move them quickly. So I already mentioned that we talk about education on different levels and different institutional and non-institutional context, but we are also talking about civil engagement and influencing how people perceive things, how they relate to one another and what can be learned by participating in actions. And what you might hear from me talking is art education no longer means that we're teaching skills of realistic skills or depicting something, but it has, um, or self-expression, but a big part of our agenda is actually to teach kind of what kinds of actions do we take? What beliefs guide our, our actions and thinking? And what impact do they have on directly and indirectly on the cultures and societies? Um, and as, as a starting point, I always return to the notion of epistemic injustice. As we already heard from Ritva's presentation, as well as Edwards, we're not equal and even in approaching what is education, what does it mean, what role does it have in our cultures and societies, but also on individual levels, there's much to be done. Finnish education prides itself of being equal and accessible to all, but we know from various studies and um, long-term long data that not, not all students have the same kind of possibilities to participate, for example, in higher education versus vocational schools. But also when we think about education and arts education more specifically, it doesn't occur in a vacuum and as isolated from everything else. It relates to policies, laws, global movements, um, the deals we make with others, and the way we perceive everybody, um, everybody and everything else. Um, so these three concepts that I will very quickly introduce are just some of the notions that I work through when I think about education for higher education and what the people will potentially take with them and how might that have a short-term or long-term impact. One of the things that I kind of methods and pedagogical approaches I often utilize is paradoxes. How do we bring together previously disconnected or, or um, paradoxical ways we think and behave? For example, how we, this image is, we, we judge the practice of zoos, although we want to see these, these magnificent animals, where somewhere else it's, a, it's part of the livelihood and part of the economic survival of communities. So kind of pointing out and exploring with students as co-learners on how issues are complicated and how sometimes surprising elements play into things that we might perceive as something we could solve isolated from everything else. The other notion that I use is centrist and artistic curricula. And this might sound like something hippie happy tree hugging, but it's, it's framed by, it's more so understanding learners, all learners from a very holistic perspective, understanding that they bring with them to the learning situation, their experiences and all of their being. But also framing that education from a perspective of criti critical pedagogy and critical theory. And <clears throat> 
And then the last one, the last concept that I figured I would introduce here is the queering epistemology and pedagogy, queering the curricula and using various theories to support this. It might be something that a term you wouldn't necessarily use, um, use as a given when thinking about sustainable development education and art education, but there's a profound notion that is um, usable and utilizable for all of our educational thinking on how do we dismantle our norms and start thinking about learners and, and perceiving the learners and learning situations from a more flexible and diverse perspective. And this, I believe, is needed if we want to achieve at something that is more um, ethical, more radical, in a sense that it, it works towards imaginations and possibilities that might help us resolve some of the much bigger, broader tasks than what we thought maybe previously that we could resolve. And of course, in the current situation, our youth and children are very concerned about the environment and what's happening globally as it comes to politics. And there's a, there's a lots of information coming out about how ecological devastation is causing anxiety and depression in our children and youth. And to kind of combat that, we need to develop ways of educating and being that might ease some of that anxiety and help our students and the future generations as well as ourselves to kind of imagine, be hopeful and imagine potential and possibilities that are, that are achievable and, and might be sustainable in the future, um, also in the future. So I guess I don't, I think I rushed a bit, but and much I left unsaid, but basically what I was trying to do with these slides is to share with you how, when we think about what we might teach and learn jointly in higher education, we think about past, we think about the long-term futures and how we play into the global and local histories. We consider the futures predictions. We, we think about the immediate effects but we also work with very locally and on an individual basis, but also on a grander scale in a sense on national and global level and collaborate in everything we do. So I guess that completes my portion. Now, if I can Thank stop. You. Excellent. Thank you so much, Annina. And uh, I, I really like the way your presentation actually opens the whole field of discussion of what are the theoretical underpinnings, what are the notions through which we approach the whole concept of responsible action and sustainable development and, and, and the types of more practical concepts that emerge from that type of thinking. But it asks, what is our role as actors? And, and how do you see in that perspective, how do you see the role of students? Because you've been working with with students in, in arts, but some of these notions, all of these notions, actually what we've seen in a lot of Aldo's interdisciplinary work and student projects is that these notions actually can be easily translated while they might not seem uh, immediately approachable to someone coming from a, a particular engineering field, but actually in collaborative work, uh, it emerges as something that is really speaking to all of them. What's your experience from, from interdisciplinary work uh, in Aldo? Well, Aldo has a great structure, which is the UWAS, the university-wide uh, art studies. And I think that's where we can really tap into, we can definitely improve how we work together and how we utilize our different knowledges. And the fields are surprisingly similar. But for example, what I've heard from the interdisciplinary art studies is that maybe the main point is to share how kind of artistic and artist and designers architectures already think into disciplinary ways and how maybe the biggest part of our education is to look, teach people question what's given and what has become a norm and a standard and start thinking in the different ways that if we kind of 
question every aspect of what we do, the words we use, the way we take something as given and rethinking. Maybe there, are, there is the potential to kind of move us forward locally and globally. Thank you. Uh, as we in, uh, move into the panel discussion, I'd just like to invite Edward and Ritva to also join in and jump into the conversation. And perhaps first, uh, I was wondering if you have uh, first impressions on each other's presentations that you'd like to comment on. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, for me, in, in particular, the, the first presentation uh, it helped to really underline some of the differences that uh, we had also noted, but now with actual empirical figures and so on, uh, between different countries. Uh, Africa is indeed not a, not a country, and uh, we, we only uh, have been present in three countries, uh, uh, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Eritrea, which I presented today. Uh, so I think a key takeaway from, from, from what was presented by Ritva is that one really has to do your homework on the country that you're about to go to and not just base your experiences on, on the first African country you entered. Yeah, so that was quite, quite insightful. Uh, from my uh, uh, viewpoint, uh, Rina, is um, maybe two things. From Edward, um, I think when he was emphasizing this adapt to local situations is really key. And I don't think when, when I discussed that briefly in the question section, this sort of uh, Finland being the education country <clears throat> and, um, um, and, and therefore there's credibility and interest, that is true. But when working actually in any other country, culture, system, so forth, you absolutely need to be adapting to that and have knowledge of that system. There's just, uh, so that I think came out, even if it came out in a very different context, um, it's really, really worth emphasizing. I, I do think, um, yeah, uh, overall, um, multi-sectoral work we do enormously seldom. You always are in your own sphere of, uh, of, of your science, etc. So I, I, the last conversation you had with Annina is I really, that, that's what I thought is yes, we do that very, very little. Um, I think in uh, the, what Anina was presenting is kind of very new to me, I guess you can imagine for an economist, it's new. Um, and I, I, I'm reading a book right now about morality. That's why I'm trying to see how does that fit with uh, what I read in morality? How does this fit? So there, there's more to be learned, I think, on that. So that's uh, all for now, Rina. Thanks, Ritva. Mina, you had a question. Yes. First of all, thank you all for the, the great presentations. Um, Ritva, your presentation was um, so illuminating that I'm really grateful because it kind of um, uh, confirmed me on some things that I thought this is how they are, but I hadn't really looked into the figures. Um, but I also uh, have a question to you, and I know that now I'm kind of pushing for the, the simple answers that I'm usually a bit irritated when somebody is trying to do the same to me, but let me try. <laughs> so um, uh, what do you uh, think? are the, you know, the biggest obstacles or the combinations of the biggest obstacles for uh, not getting better learning outcomes, even though more years are being spent by the you know, pupils and students uh, in the classrooms. You were, you were saying you know, a number of things like uh, teachers uh, level of um, of teachers' abilities and, and so on and so forth. But, 
but is it like uh, is it that or is it something else or is there something that is underlying that you actually weren't able to show uh, with the empirical evidence that you uh, presented to us? A simple answer, Minna. <laughs> so thank you for the question. I'm going ahead, Rina. That's fine. Yeah, good. Okay, so biggest obstacles. This is how I think about the, the issue. I think that education is a re education system is a reflection of society. It's a reflection of politics. It's a reflection of, um, we, we often say relationships of accountability between citizens and politicians and those who provide the services. So it, there is no simple answer. What, what I tried to show like in, um, just to say that in development economics, uh, it's really super fashionable right now to evaluate interventions for impact. I come from an understanding now that interventions, if the system is, has big issues, interventions alone won't do it. So I mentioned this RISE program that I've been engaged with uh, the last six years. It's the biggest effort in the world to understand uh, developing country education systems. It, what it tries to do three things. It tries to look at symptoms like those learning profiles. It tries to diagnose in various ways. I showed one way that I've been involved myself actually to invent that service delivery indicators, which sort of goes one step forward and says, okay, what about teachers? Do they come to school? In many systems, teachers don't come to school. They, they don't go to class. 45% of teachers in Mozambique don't go to class at any given time, et cetera, et cetera. That diagnosing. Then you come to research and it becomes very much complex, but I think the RISE program has been able to demonstrate some things that are actually, because they are solidly demonstrated, they become simple. Meaning kids stay behind, they get behind the first three years. If they get behind the first three years, there is no remedy. They can sit. So, so I'll give you one other figure because economists are all about figures. Um, the latest simulations show that in the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal, there are two goals, get kids to school and get them learning. Okay, if you get kids to school, instead of 30% of world children now completing 10 grades, if 100% completed 10 grades, they would only improve nine PISA points. What does nine PISA points mean? PISA, the um, average is, um, the, the mean is 500, and then 100 is the standard deviation. Nine points is less than one-tenth of standard deviation, nothing, little. So what it tells you is that if the system doesn't change, okay, th th there is no hope of, of getting the learning. Um, and what is it in the system? I'm a I'm big believer in systems are driven by politics. Prosperity is driven by politics. Uh, countries are prosperous when you, have when you have very solid state power that can deliver services. And when you have a very strong civil society that keeps the state power in control. Okay, this is a very big uh, st stratospherical point, but that's just how it is. Maybe one final thing to say is that many incentive systems, uh, or let's say incentives in the education systems are tuned to enrollment. They are not tuned to learning, mm. they are tuned to enrollment. I mentioned in some systems, they are tuned to uh, kind of uh, finding the kids who can go to university, who can go to civil service or something. They are like gatekeeper kind of thing. But it means that the systems are geared, their politics, their delivery, their everything towards, let's say, enrollment and gatekeeping. So these are big issues. And, and 
I never would like to hear anyone in Finland to say, oh, let's take one country and develop the education system. That is so impossible and crazy idea. So, so the, these are really deep um, system-wide, society-wide issues. Sorry to be so long, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering, Annina, if you had also a comment on the other presentations. Oh, I am just happy that we are having these conversations and I hope we can somehow sustain them and continue on them. And I think that it's kind of exactly what we're thinking about when PISA introduced the idea that we will soon start testing creativity. Our first question was creativity by, defined by who? And that's exactly where we are constantly. It depends on what we define, what we, what we count as learning. What does learning mean? And is it really math and, and writing reading? Is that what is most essential for every child in every context. And for us, it became a very political question. If the French define creativity, it's very different than if the Polish, Polish people would define it or based on that cultural understanding and context. So none of that, and I think that's always important to think about is it's not, I value PISA and all that mass data that is there, but we also, since we are so privileged in Finland and in the Alto context, it's our responsibility to turn around and say, what is the information we're collecting and what does it really matter? Are there other measures we should also consider? I guess that's... Thank you. I think we are running out of time for today. Perhaps just a quick comment on, on uh, how uh, all of these topics actually do come together. I was uh, reading um, uh, from the UN Intellectual History Project that came out in 2009. I think they did quite a lot of research on, on the history of the United Nations and how it has evolved with and together with our intellectual thinking. And, and it's really interesting to see that within those discussions, what we see is this entire broad range. So we start and depart from, from academic discussions, from policy discussions, from practice-based uh, activities. And what we see is constant distilling and cr uh, crystallization of those ideas into globally approved concepts and norms. So if today we have the sustainable development goals that uh, did not come from nothing, it also is embedded in decades of talk, uh, including all of this variety of perspectives that are coming together. Then we turn these into actionable tools and resources that we can use where we are working on something in practice, but it is tied to this broader constant ongoing debate and one day there will be something that will be adding up to what is currently a picture of today's views or those of, of a few years ago when we started with the sustainable development goals so this is a kind of constant ongoing evolving exercise and i think that this discussion today has been uh, brilliant in showing the, di the vi diversion and diversity of perspectives that are coming into play it all comes in as a tapestry. Uh, universities are best placed to be actors in this regard and, uh, and it's beautiful, uh, important work that we're uh, hearing about and uh, not just as on individual goals in their own right, but also as uh, education as an enabler, of course, for all of the other sustainable development goals to also be accomplished. So thank you all for attending. I would also very much like to um, invite you to join our next talk, which is going to be on the 27th of November on the topic of access to sustainable energy. So please join us for the next talk. And thank you very much to all the panelists and participants today. Thank, thank you. you.